So I want to welcome everyone. Happy New Year. My goodness, already 2022. Can you believe it? Um, this is our 24th webinar and the first webinar for our second season. We're so happy to have you with us and we're very excited. Today, we're gonna to have a slightly different format. We have been wondering how we might be able to uh, um, offer the deepest wisdom that Jen has to offer about the gift in the heart of language. So our first webinar, and there'll be probably three that deal specifically with language. Um, this first one, Jen is going to speak for about 45 minutes and then our esteemed guests, Vandana Shiva, <clears throat> Megha Mahan, Susan Petrelli, and Annie Finch will be with us. And they'll um, each have about 10 minutes at the end um, after Jen speaks to respond or ask a question. And then with all of that, um, Jen may come back and respond and there may be uh, time for questions for those of you who are not familiar with Genevieve. She is an independent researcher who lives part-time in Italy and in Texas. She created a multicultural all-women activist foundation for a compassionate society that had its run from 1987 to 2005. She is the founding mother of the Temple of Sekhmet in Nevada that uh, was founded in 1992 and is still an active temple, the only one that we know of that's completely operating in the gift. She's an author of many books. The Foundational Theory was written in uh, Forgiving. She's the founding mother along with others in uh, for the International Feminist for the Gift Economy. And we're very, very excited um, this year because her book, The Gift in the Heart of Language is being translated and will be published in Italian. Um, so without further ado, Genevieve, please welcome and... Thank you, thank you, Letitia, thanks so much. And uh, welcome everybody. I think uh, language is an important, oh goodness, somebody's at the door right this minute, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, language is a very important aspect of humanity. And uh, I think we don't usually include it enough in our idea of of social change and uh, our ideas of linguistics and philosophy of language are not necessarily that progressive. And mainly I think also is that there is a great hidden aspect of language, which is that it actually comes from mothering and the relation between the mother and child. And this is really not something that uh, has been accepted or even looked into very much by, by linguists and philosophers of language. There have been some people, there's a woman, Dean uh, Falk, there's uh, uh, and other people who um, have, have a, paid attention to mothering, but to see it as really the foundation of language itself is uh, not usual. So um, I'm going to ask Diane to put up my PowerPoint. And while I'm waiting for her to do that, okay. Um, I did want to say, let's see, before we get actually start this, um, I, I wanted to say that we are in a moment of, of tremendous distress. And whatever we can do to make it right will be uh, very important for the future of, of the earth. And so I believe that we have had a wrong idea about who we are 
and that we need to change that idea and turn to something much more profound and uh, more simple. We are not really um, a, 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 let's say, a bad or a um, violent, uh, destructive human race species. We're actually a, a, a very wonderful species that has really gotten it wrong for many, many years. So um, uh, let me begin uh, with talking about language. So my first uh, it, um, title is that language is a virtual maternal gift economy that we learn in our earliest years and that continues throughout life to show us what giving and receiving in abundance would be. It is a gift from our community and it helps us create community going forward. Change. Yeah. The study of the gift economy by Eurocentric anthropologists has been influenced by Marcel Mose, who interpreted it as having three steps, giving, receiving, and giving back. However, there is a gift economy that comes before this in every life, the unilateral economy of early childhood. Since babies cannot give back an equivalent of what they have been given, someone has to give to them unilaterally. I believe this model of unilateral giving and receiving is the basic template for all our future, future relations, which are variations on it. Even market exchange is a variation, a doubling back of unilateral giving upon itself, and usually also requiring quantification and an equation. Change slide. Unilateral giving and receiving is the first way we create human relationships with each other to and through things given and received. The model that giving and receiving provides is the first and most profound throughout life, but it is discounted, made invisible and exploitatable by the economy of quid pro quo exchange. Change. Because language is a universal human faculty and it is learned so early in life, many people believe it is a genetic inheritance. For example, Noam Chomsky, whose political integrity, courage, and knowledge I admire, as a linguist, believes language started some 200,000 years ago in a great leap, a mutation he calls merge, that allows words to be joined together. But there is another possible universal basis for language other than genetics. Change. This basis is the universal fact that in order to survive, human children have to be unilaterally nurtured for a long time. The model of unilateral care was probably as present and as necessary in prehistory as it is today, if not more so. Giving appropriately and receiving competently are the two necessary aspects of this interaction. Giving and receiving not only in nurturing care, but with sounds and other signs form what I believe is the basis of human language. The maternal gift economy is different from the Mosian gift of three steps. We find meaning already in the first two aspects, giving and receiving, which need to be investigated together as a unit and put foremost in order to see how fundamental they are and how much they are responsible for our thinking and for life itself. In fact, the patterns of the unilateral gift can be found everywhere. The gift gives rise to a multitude of variations, but at least for humans, these can all be traced back to maternal care as the source pattern. I believe it is the grounding of the gift in mutuality of giver and receiver, this sense of merge, that motivates most of, mo much of our material and verbal communication, our conviviality, as uh, Hélène Caillé says. Change. 
In my view, syntax does not depend upon rules, but upon ways or schemas of giving and receiving. Words that are given to each other merge, such as black cat. Trans transitive sentences role play giving and receiving. The girl hit the ball plays out the roles of giver, gift, and receiver. The girl is the giver, hit is the gift, and ball is the receiver. The girl hit the ball that fell into the gutter puts that into the role of giver again, and the word, word fell as the gift, while gutter is the receiver. So that fell into the gutter is another piece of a gift transaction. We can understand sentences and disambiguate ambiguous ones by deciding which words are given to which. There's Chomsky's example, or they are flying planes. You have to know if flying is being given to planes or they are is being given to flying planes. And But it, it's not a question of um, the, the grammar as he says it but a question of organized giving and receiving these ways of uniting are not rules but ways of giving and receiving which also inform our view of the world that we perceive around us moreover recent neurobiological studies have shown that genetic determinism does not function in independently but there are epigenetic processes that influence which genes will actually manifest and how, depending on the experiences of the infant. Since her survival depends on it, the infant necessarily has the daily experience of being given to and receiving. So this will necessarily be an important factor in which in, 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 in deciding which genes manifest and how. Thus, unilateral giving and receiving is available now as it was in the distant past as an important model for language and other human capacities. Language is learned in early childhood in the environment of unilateral maternal care. However, linguists and philosophers of language and even infancy researchers typically live in the economy of exchange. They do not give much importance to the model of unilateral giving economy, and their answers to questions about the nature of language leave gifting aside while reflecting the abstractions of economic exchange. It would be reasonable to correct for this usually unrecognized bias of the researchers and look at the relation of language to unilateral giving beyond exchange and its categorizations and quantifications. In fact, as a process and a paradigm that comes mainly after language learning, it is probable that market exchange derives some of its aspects from language and maternal practice rather than vice versa. And I'll talk about that maybe in the next uh, salon. Seeing unilateral giving as primary and fundamental is made more difficult because we misdefine giving as exchange. The term exchange has the presupposition of quid pro quo built in. But in fact, the mother feeds the baby. The baby does not have to feed the mother in exchange. Their interaction is based on imitation, not obligation. In fact, it is more appropriate to talk about turn taking. For example, each takes a turn in giving unilaterally to the other gestures, smiles, and vocalizations in what researchers call proto conversation. The care and nurture that are supplied unilaterally to the child by the mother and create the model of unilateral gifting provisioning are also the first economy from which later economies are derived. Exchange is a variation on giving, not giving a variation on exchange. Giving is first. Normally, quid pro quo exchange only begins to be understood around three years of age. 
foreshadowed perhaps by an experience of reward and punishment and conditional giving. However, monetary exchange, buying and selling in the market processes are not usually completely understood even until puberty. Children's own ignorance protects them from the logic of the market for several years. So they live in a unilateral gift economy, whether or not the parents expect to be paid back by the child in their own old age, or a primary caregiver is being paid for her work, or the child herself is expected to work as soon as she is able. I have been trying to bring forward the idea of the unilateral gift economy for many years in opposition to the economy based on market exchange. The group of friends who are members of the International Feminists for a Gift Economy and I often talk about the different aspects of this idea. One of them, Angela Miles, said the other day something that clarifies the hesitation people have about the gift economy. She said that people don't think that unilateral giving is relational. Instead, they think exchange is relational because the receiver is bound to give back. But no, unilateral giving and receiving is relational in itself, and it is typical of human experience from early childhood onwards. A positive bond is created by recognizing another's need and satisfying it appropriately, while the receiver recognizes the appropriate satisfaction of her need by the other. There is mutual recognition, gratitude, and a sense of accompaniment and accomplishment regarding both the interactors, the interaction, and the need satisfying gift. The receiver is not passive. She has to actively do something to receive and use the gift. The initiative of the gifter is wasted and canceled if there is no receiver. In unilateral gifting, the giver attends to and recognizes the need of the potential receiver. Then she procures, makes, or does something that will satisfy the need appropriately taking into consideration the immediate need and the somewhat larger picture. The baby is hungry. How long has it been since she ate? What shall I feed her? The child creatively receives, focusing on the gift and the giver. For example, actively sucking at the breast and swallowing, attending intensely to the mother. Meanwhile, during this time, the young child's brain is developing at 1 million new neuron connections a second. Just incredible. So you can see in this picture how the, the nature, the tree nature of the mothers is, is being repeated in the nature of the baby's brain. It's just a pretty um, fanciful kind of a, a, of a design which is called the tree of life. And there, can, you can change the picture now. There are many different levels of analysis that one can access regarding language and regarding gifting, like focusing a microscope. Usually we have looked at them with a focus that excludes gifting. And so we have missed the different strands and the way they interconnect. In fact, unilateral giving and receiving often seems too simple even to notice, though we practice its analogs all the time in activities like breathing out and breathing in. Once we accept the importance of unilateral giving and receiving, we can use that framework for other aspects of life. <clears throat> for example, perceiving can be seen as receiving. As babies receive the gift of mother's milk, we all receive the gifts of perception of mother nature. So we're all in front of, of mother nature, receiving and perceiving uh, all of our en enormous experience that we have around us. And if we think of that in terms of exchange, there's a barrier, a quid pro quo barrier in between us and nature. But if you think of it in terms of giving and receiving, then it's clear that Perceiving is receiving. 
uh, it is clear that the relation of giving and receiving, which is already present in the womb in a physiological sense, necessarily begins interpersonally at birth and is fundamental and in early childhood also. In, it comes long before the stages of what researchers call proto-conversation and joint attention, but it informs them. In proto-conversation, postures, touch, facial expressions, vocalizations are given and received and given again reciprocally to each other by mother and child. This interaction is based on turn-taking and imitation, uh, imitation and giving, not on quid pro quo exchange. This is a picture of proto-conversation. Change the side, slide. The Harvard Center for Child Development emphasizes the importance of this interaction for children's brain development, but calls it serve and return, using a reference to the game of tennis to describe it. Instead, I believe that the game of tennis is itself a metaphor of giving and receiving on the athletic reality plane. Giving and receiving come before tennis. People use the wrong words when they're describing any kind of gift interaction. Okay, now this is a slide showing joint attention. Will you change slide? Joint attention occurs when two people direct their attention towards the same thing of interest, often doing this by pointing so as to direct another's attention to the same source. When infants understand this gesture, they are sim sim simultaneously processing another person's mental state, recognizing that this object is something that another person thinks is of interest, thus illustrating the beginning phases of the theory of mind. I've changed it. There might be a delay before you see it. Oh, OK. The theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states, beliefs, intents, desires, emotion, and knowledge to ourselves and others. As humans, we assume that others want, think, believe, and the like, and thereby infer states that are not directly observable, using these states anticipatorially to predict the behavior of others as well as our own. These inferences, which amount to a theory of mind, are to our knowledge universal in human adults. Motherers also infer the states and conditions of their children, which allows them to address the children's needs at all levels. How I think it works. When I want to talk to you about cats, I use the word cat to satisfy your momentary need which is also my momentary need to create a communicative relation with you. By reading your mind, I realize that you are not thinking of a cat right now. We have a common need to relate to cats together, even though my need arose first. I have to satisfy your need for that word gift in order for you to know what I wanna talk about. I give you the word gift, the word gift, and you receive it. So we are in a relation of joint attention now to each other regarding cats. That may seem a little bit uh, uh, too complicated, but maybe when we do it, it doesn't seem that complicated. Salience refers to the prominence of information. Salient items pop out and capture attention. Christian Chiarcos uh, and, uh, et al. in uh, talked about how in joint attention, both interactors relate themselves to the same salient item. So here you have a, one salient item that's popping out from a background. The pointing finger pops out too, so that both the object of attention and the hand have the same iconic form. This happens in the game of pea pie that people play with babies. So we're actually sharing perceptions that are salient for all of us, especially when we're using words. And those perceptions are the, word, are the gifts of the world that the words refer to. 
and in the beginning with the, between the baby and the mother uh there is her uh, attribution of of different values to the things around in the world so the mother's face pops out and registered registers different valences they're called values regarding the baby and the world around them the baby reads the mother's face and attributes similar valences to whatever the mother is perceiving including the baby herself so you can see there are all kinds of different emotions and they're um stronger or weaker compare depending on what the mother is um feeling and so that is a, is showing what the value of the perceptual gift is, whether it's positive or negative, or whether it's um, something that she likes or doesn't like, and you should like and not, and so on. So um, using word gifts to satisfy communicative and cognitive needs. Syntax is a projection of the relations created by giving and receiving onto the verbal plane itself. The virtual gift items of language are not made of pixels, but of modulations of sound, which can also be transcribed in writing. Words are virtual gifts that are shared as common property by the members of a linguistic community. Through them, we are in contact with something of the consciousness of others, as well as those who have come before us, because we know they have or had those word gifts and gifts of the world in mind. We have the words in abundance because when we give them to others, we do not lose them ourselves. Rather, the fact that we have them and can give and receive them without losing them demonstrates that we are similar to each other. The collection of word gifts that our cultures pass down to us is a collective gift from societies of the past to those of the present. The French linguist Ferdinand de Saussure called the collective gift the langue, while he called the individual use of words in speech parole. We can see the same distinction now between individual gifting and collective cultural gifts. Of course, the one does not exist without the other. People satisfied each other's communicative and cognitive needs in the past with words given to them by the community. And like them, we do the same thing. According to Chomsky, there is a universal grammar genetically inherited by all that provides a structure of thought, which is expressed, he says, externalized in speech in all languages, but in different ways. I believe that the structure of thought instead is the structure of giving and receiving. We learn it from the care that we receive and we use it to structure our lives even though it is often canceled and exploited by exchange. Gifting is our language of thought and of perception. And here you see the network of gifts that, are, uh, that we see through, that we use to see. We project the giving and receiving onto the universe and find them there. We receive the gifts of the light, of photosynthesis, of all the animals and plants. Our neurons travel along pathways sculpted by giving and receiving in childhood and ongoing into adult life. Our language continues to function according to the gift paradigm, even when we are completely engaged in the market and we cannot see gifts, gifts except as targets for exploitation. Language shows us that what we must do to survive now as homo donans, the, the giving being, not homo sapiens, the knowing being, because we don't know, perhaps we have never known, at least in patriarchal capitalist world, who we are. And unless we can regain our heritage as a mothered and mothering species, we will not survive. We have embraced the exchange paradigm that is parasitic on gifting and cancels it so we cannot see the world as it really is. 
linguistics under the exchange abstraction does not recognize the connection with gifting mothering and instead uses computation as an explanation for the mental processes that recognize and choose words and their meanings. They do it statistically. However, computation has a gift basis as well in one plus one, which is giving one to one and two minus one, which is giving one from two. By explain, explaining language's computation, we raise a barrier against understanding it as gifting. And so find no commonality between meaning in language and meaning in life. Our misunderstanding of gift versus exchange in terms of mainly individual good versus evil allows the problems to intensify. The elimination of the gift paradigm as the deep infrastructure of the species makes individuals feel that following it or not is a personal choice and it is just as human and justifiable to follow a paradigm of self-interest, which we also justify at large social scales among genders, races, nations, etc. We can do this because we have eliminated the hypothesis of the gift paradigm as the foundational paradigm of the human. And we have not investigated it as such in those specific areas like language in which it could have served to give credence to our recognition of ourselves as homo donuts. There is an alternative. And you see here that the network of giving goes all across the earth and that's understanding relationship as based on giving and receiving. And they're also giving and receiving words through their these, these hands. So I got this from the internet and it was in a, um, I wanted to show you all this because this is the picture of exchange and all of these, these uh, barcodes being put on every, everything in nature instead of uh, recognizing nature as gifting. So there, there's that. So the shift towards the mo model of maternal care as the source of meaning, away from the more mechanistic and computational model, moves us towards a paradigm in which the focus is on the other and care is normal, functional, and creative. This is in complete disaccord with the neoliberal paradigm of normality of self-interest. And this is what I propose. Thank you for the gift of your attention. Thank you, Jen. That was really fabulous. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to share about their experience of your words. Um, Vandana, are you here? I see you. Am I stayed up late again? <laughs> yes. Welcome from I'm India, sorry. and thank you so much for joining us again. Yeah, and I have a rotten, rotten back, so it's difficult to sit up but i'm here for with love for jen and all of you <laughs> wonderful thank you so you have about so, 10 minutes to respond to jen well, and then... even, even less than time first of all thank you again jen and um for for constantly taking uh your thinking and philosophy deeper and teaching us all so much let me begin with that you know the the image with the barcodes on all of nature. Now that has ended up being the, my primary work, you know, barcodes on property, um, intellectual property on the seed, on, on all living beings. Uh, so I, I would say that actually the, the exchange model that has to end up in the extreme of unilateral taking, you know, you talk of unilateral giving and unilateral gift giving as the basis of all life, all human life, all life in nature, our relationship with nature. Uh, and then of course there's the exchange. But I think what we are at now is unilateral taking, owning, owning on the very false ground 
of creating. And, and in the next salon, we'll have much more opportunity to talk about that. And I look forward to it. You said towards the end, Jen, unless we reclaim our capacity of giving, we will not survive. And I'm just thinking this afternoon, I was reading a whole series of articles, a cover of Newsweek, a publication in a public health journal. The title of all of them is The Case for Killing Granny. This is serious. The Case for Killing Granny. Now, if you just think of the fact that when COVID started, the first deaths were all in care homes, yeah? Care homes where old people are put, which already is a rupture. You know, it's the end of gift. You, you, you said it so beautifully, you know, that when the mother takes care of the child, the child has nothing to give. But over time, over a lifetime, when, the peop uh, when parents get too old, it's the children who take care of them, at least in decent societies. We then thought in exchange societies, we can outsource caring and put them away in old people's home. And the old people's homes then became care homes and became places of making money. And now this um, perverse logic of capitalist patriarchy is bringing us to a point that, you know, it, it doesn't make economic sense to keep these old people alive. And that's the logic they're using, the case for killing granny. But if you were to then take it to children, I mean, look at the number of children who are being born with autism. Look at the number of children who are born with deformities because of chemicals and pesticides and everything wrong we are doing with our food and our environment. The unconditional giving that you talk about very naturally allows any parent to not just give to the child who is autistic or is deformed, but even give, give even more. And I have watched this, I've observed this all over the place. Now, if you allow that logic and economics of the case for killing granny, you bring it to the children, then you have the case of killing children with deformities. You have the case of killing children. And you basically then have what the logic of exchange that you talk about ending up ending up as eugenics. So when you talk, you, you, when you caution us, unless we reclaim our capacity of giving, we will not survive. You are talking about a reality we are in today and you're showing the way out of that crisis. And again, you don't have to, you know, the, 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 the beautiful part of your thinking is, giving is something that comes from within us. You don't have to wait for some big powerful daddies giving, you know, you don't have to wait for a philanthropic capitalist. So thank you again, Jen. I'm happy I was able to join the salon and look forward to the next. Thank you. Thank you, Vandana. Jen, do you have anything that you would like to uh, respond to some of the words that were offered by Vandana? Well, I just say that what we need to do is normalize giving, that it needs to be what we do uh, and we approve of it and everybody approves of it. It seems like something extraordinary, but instead it's really the basis of human life, of language and so on. And so we've gotten out of that, out of that thought. We don't think that anymore. And so it seems like if we're doing, if we're giving something worth being extraordinary, but it's just, it's just who we are as human beings has to, has to do with giving and not and receiving, of course, and not with exchange in, 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 in quid pro quo. So that's my thought on what Vandana said. Thanks, Jen. Next, we have Migma Han, who is calling in and her territory, her country of um, the Wakanabe peoples, um, the colonial identification of Canada. So Migmahan, do you have some words you'd like to offer to us? And welcome, please. Thank you. And um, it's such an honor to be here in a circle of uh, women 
people who are here as well joined in this conversation. Um, I'm so glad that I was able to be part of this circle today and listening to you, Jen, about uh, your research on language, uh, language and uh, the gift given, gift receiving. And uh, it's so hopeful uh, us uh, for my, in the work that uh, in, in my life experience, I'm a fluent, I'm fluent in my language and we've been working on healing indigenous languages, specifically with Wabanaki, uh, which is a, a family of the Algonquin uh, Alagunk, which is our language as well, meaning we are all related and that we are from uh, the, the our long house is an extend it's extended where the sun comes up to where the sun sets. So we have a family that, uh, that uh, is right across the lands here in what most people know, what everyone knows as Canada. And, uh, but we are still, uh, it is still recognized that we are on unceded, unsurrendered land of Wabanaki. Uh, so in just say laying that foundation of uh, who we are as a people, uh, one of the things that I, uh, so appreciate is about all the affirmations, confirmation in the research you've done and uh, to be able to draw on that when we begin to take the next steps forward in uh, healing our languages. As, as you know, uh, colonization um, has uh, uh, in the beginning times outlawed our languages, indigenous languages were outlawed uh, and that uh, therefore uh, we were not able to um, maintain our own spiritual practices or our cultural practices because language holds our worldview, which is uh, defines who we are and how we are as a people. And so we in before the colonization of our languages or the institutionalization of our languages, uh, they were made in, they were disconnected from our original understanding of where the language comes from. And it comes from uh, the land. Uh, it comes from the maternal foundation that you spoke about. And so, um, the, the languages of uh, the people are rooted in a mother relations uh, on very unconditional um, expression of love. So therefore we know that, uh, um, that our languages were uh, before colonization, they were not, there was no words in, uh, in Mi'kmaq, Wabanaki that was, they were not, there were no derogatory words. Our language was not sexist. It was not racist. There was no words that would devalue life. And so uh, it was uh, uh, our source of um, way of being came from the land that you, uh, your uh, PowerPoint imaged with the mother feeding the child and, and what's in the breast is a representation what where that source allowed the mother to be able to give was from that gift of the land, the river, the you know the the trees and so on. So it it just um, I have to say it's my first time listening to a presentation that I feel oh my God she gets she gets uh, what <laughs> you know what we've been talking about for all these years and and like like everyone here we're up against the same um conditions we've all been colonized you know and the languages have been uh shifted from the natural way of gifting uh to a uh, capitalistic this capitalism of uh, that labeling and ownership and so on. So now there's like not a natural reciprocal, you know, harmonious exchange of love or gift 
uh, among people, but now there's this uh, can, uh, thought of um, you can't totally receive without being pressured or stressed to feel like, what do you have to give back? <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's um, so somewhere else along the way, we get disconnect, we got disconnected in, uh, in, in our connection to our maternal uh, way of being. So I, so much to say, uh, and I look forward, you know, and I'm, um, thinking like I got to I got to stay in in connection here and you know uh, thank you so much thank you so much for your work what you what you've brought here today and it's very uh, it's a, a very empowering thank, thank you. you thank you how wonderful thank you Meg Mahan well Jen how does that how does that sound to you well, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so so honored that you um, that you find the commonality with it. It's, that's so great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, so we look so forward to hearing more in our next salon in two weeks, Meg Mahan, from you about language. So our <clears throat> our next guest is uh, Susan Petrelli. Susan? Eccomi. Hello. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, and a joy to be here to honour uh, Jen and listen to, listen to her work, uh, which is really important uh, from the point of view of the language sciences um, and the science sciences. So I just wanted to say, ju just show you, that this is the book that um, is at the center of our attention today. Let's say this is Jen's uh, extraordinary, I must say extraordinary book entitled The Gift in the Heart of Language, The Maternal Source of Meaning. It's a big book <laughs> that has been translated into Italian um, and it's a, a truly scholarly book. It's, um, it's really well researched and really well informed. It's serious stuff. It's big stuff, I, I must say. Um, there is just so much that we could say. It, it really is difficult in, in such a short uh, time. But what I would like to point out is that um, uh, the language that... Um, language sciences have flourished uh, in the 19th century, let's say, um, particularly like we have Ferdinand de Saussure, who Jane cites and cited in her um, talk today, uh, is considered as the father of general linguistics. So at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, and this science, becomes all important for language studies uh, generally across the world. Um, and, and when the language sciences includes linguistics and philosophy of language, today the neurosciences are very important. Um, um, but when Saussure was working uh, and analyzing language, uh, other, other language sciences were uh, arising, semantics, um, semiotics, semitology, semiology, and then philosophy of language, et cetera, et cetera, which is a dis which perhaps from a historical point of view is, is a more traditional kind of science. Now, the important thing to, uh, to underline, I think, is that talking about general linguistics, which is the, the linguistic science that dominated um, the human sciences, even anthropology with Levi-Strauss. Levi-Strauss used um, uh, Saussure's linguistics as his model for his studies in anthropology, uh, which he uh, carried forth mainly in uh, Latin America. Um, the point is that uh, Saussure developed his linguistics in tight connection with economics, with political economy. Uh, he used political economy, Jen knows this, as a model for his, linguistic, uh, for his linguistics model. But what 
political economy did he refer to? He referred to marginalism, marginalism from the school of Lausanne in Switzerland. Marginalism, uh, there were various trends, uh, certainly some better than others, but the point is that it was, it put the exchange model at the heart of things, the exchange model, do ut des, quad pri quo, which is what we are criticizing and what, uh, what uh, Jen is rightly reacting to. This was, um, it, it's, just, it's quite extraordinary that such an important uh, trend in studies in the science sciences, language sciences, actually referred to economics, putting linguistics and economics together, but to a, a specific type of trend, which is the trend uh, from which so, uh, so much trouble arises in language studies and in life in the world. So uh, from the point of view of the sign sign sciences and the language sciences, um, Jane's approach is in fact revolutionary. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, I feel very close to her approach because I in fact also um, talk about communication and otherness, language and otherness. Uh, and I know there are differences, you know, we, we do speak different languages uh, in a sense, uh, but we also come together uh, in, on, on many points. Uh, Jen's gift, when Jen analyzes language, she's looking at verbal language, but she's also looking at, can I say, uh, the a priori with respect to what happens uh, in communication through verbal language. Uh, which is not what, in fact, this is what is missing in, in, in most scholarship on language studies and science studies. Um, language and science studies tend to stop at the level of describing what's happening, uh, the traffic, language, uh, the traffic in language, what's happening at the level of language. And they describe it according to these models which have been handed down to us and which we know are limited. Um, in fact, um, you know, science, uh, all sciences are not free of ideology, um, of a vision of things. Um, often this vision of things is hidden. We, we don't know how many linguists know about the economic model behind linguistics. Not many, not many at all. Um, so what is interesting um, is that Jen looks beyond, she's, she's interested in, in verbal language, absolutely. And that is sacrosanto, it's absolutely fundamental. We, that's what we need to understand. What is going on, you know, when we communicate through verbal language, which is uh, um, uh, one of the dominant communication systems we operate through. But at the same time, she's going beyond and looking at the a priori, what makes language possible, right? Um, the gift, and she, uh, and she evidences this capacity for gift giving, uh, which I undersign completely. Um, I talk about otherness, um, but I can see, uh, I can see that um, our conceptions come, they, they do overlap. They do overlap. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned um, uh, Angela Miles, I, I don't know how to pronounce, yeah. is that right? Yes. Um, okay. Observation that the problem that people say that the problem with the gift giving model as you propose it is that, <clears throat> is, is the question of relation. Uh, there's no relation involved. That is, this is an example of the misconception and the misunderstanding that circulates in language and in at the meta level in our understanding of language. Because this is the whole point that relation uh, as we are uh, describing it uh, and as it motivates, mo as it nurtures life is not about equal exchange, though des, you know, 
if I give you this, what do you give me back? It's all about, it's all about uh, giving, giving without return in this turn, turn taking, spiraling, let's say, movement. Um, and this is what makes life possible, which is extraordinary. And it's the lesson that, as Jan, Jen says, uh, we forget. Um, but we forget because dominant ideology makes sure we forget. We're put into classifications, we're put into categories, we're used to thinking like that, uh, thinking in classifications, categories, and these classifications and categories are driven by um, a particular given, a particular type of logic, which I call identity logic, uh, which we could call closed identity, the logic that excludes the other, that is indifferent to the other, that does not want to know about the other. How is that kind of ideology, that kind of logic going to encourage and help uh, to recover the gift economy? Yeah. No, no way. It, it's not convenient from the point of view of the dominant system, of dominant ideology. Um, I just wanted to, um, from Jane's incredible book, uh, just let me read, there's, um, it's all worth reading, obviously. I'll just just a few lines here, because I read in it, I read in it a message of hope. Uh, I'll read it first. Gift giving, gift giving in language continually exercises and elaborates a kind of human identity based on gift processes, even though we are not usually conscious of it, which is so true. We're not conscious of all the gift giving that is going on, in fact. Um, but think of what we're doing now. We're here together and we're communicating. And we're communicating what, what, what does this act consist in, if not reaching out to the other, uh, reaching out to the other, uh, joining attention, reflecting together, trying to understand together, this is gift, this is in the sign of gift logic. And it's what we're doing all the same and we just do not know it. We communicate, we use language to reach out to the other. Otherwise, what, what are we doing? Then what happens? We have the different systems throughout time and civilization that organize our lives through institutions and laws, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, human rights, human rights come from the body. Gift language comes from the body. Gift giving comes from the body. It's written in our bodies, but then we have laws and human rights that are all about the rights, my rights, self-interest, identity rights, and forget about the rights of the other. Anyway, um, this is the secret gift in the heart of language, exactly, the gift. It's the secret gift in the heart of language. It's the secret gift in the heart of human relationships. It's the secret gift of our relationship with the world uh, and of the planet towards us, which we are destroying. This is how stupid we are. This is the secret gift in the heart of language. And it's perhaps what has attracted so many researchers to the search of, to the study of language. Uh, during the last centuries of increasing domination by the market, the greedy market, and its values of separation, domination, and egocentric accumulation. In spite of the marginal, marginalization of the gift economy and the discrediting of nurturing, we remain homo donans because we continue to practice Altercentric gift giving in many levels of language. So that to me, and we, I could go on and on and read and read, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, the fact that gift giving is structural to language, is inherent to language, is a hope for the future. And this is important to understand. It's our hope. Uh, in language, we cannot suppress um, the uh, propensity for gift giving. Otherwise, in fact, communication will stop. When communication stops, life stops. There are no two ways about that. So, uh, 
Thank you, Jen. It is such an important message that we need to read today from this point of view as well. It's such a serious time in terms of emergency, uh, crisis all over the planet. And it's just so interesting how uh, we need to get serious about studying also to understand, you know, how things work and what we can actually do and how powerful humanity can actually be uh, if, if we're only ready to continue this fight, to get out of all the traps that language, <laughs> ideology, politics, economics uh, sets for us. We're capable of getting free of all this. We're capable of being creative and going beyond. It's written in language. It's written in our bodies. And I think this is something that you underline really well. So thank you. Thank you, thank Susan. You so, yes, thank you so much, Susan. Jen, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thank you. I mean, you're a wonderful, a wonderful friend. And thank you so much. And um, I do think language is kind of, it's a kind of a guideline. It's a it's a a, a, a bridge across the uh, uh, across the chasm that we're facing. It's it is uh, has in it, you know, the instructions for for survival, yeah. and uh, and survival of the community because we have to have the community around us that we create as we're as we're speaking and and listening so you know, the funny thing is that even um communication experts today continue um analyzing language in terms of the exchange of messages yeah in terms of equal exchange in terms of intentional equal exchange even the experts and I this know. is a problem because language is much more communication is much more than that it transcends it's transcendent with respect to exchange, equal exchange and intentional communication. All it takes is to reflect about what goes on uh, when we love somebody, you know, all the communication that goes on when we love or in friendship or in, in communication uh, in, as we are carrying it out today to understand that. It's not just intentional exchange of messages at all, at all. Yeah, Thank I you, think Susan. it's just because we've left out the maternal model. Mm. Mm. We've left out the mother, and we've, yeah. you know, also uh, penalized mothering for for centuries and yeah. and discredited absolutely mothering as as we discredited the gift economy. So yeah. and nature. Yeah. So yeah. we are, you know, all. Uh, it's uh, it's a one big package that we could get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> How are we going to do it? <laughs> yes. Well, I hope that you bring some of those ideas to the next salon, Susan and Jen. Um, so let's move on to Annie, and then we'll have some time at the end for a little bit more conversation and maybe answering some of these questions. So Annie, what, what would you like to offer? Thank you. I haven't actually said anything yet. I was just... <laughs> Wow, that <laughs> was. Oh, thank you. Um, I was so so moved by hearing Jen talk. I felt as if I were the baby at the breast, listening to this beautiful ideas coming forth, and uh, looking again at the book uh, last night, "The Gift in the Heart of Language." I was so struck by the simplicity, the the lucent. Uh, vibrancy of the of the writing uh, with these extremely complex ideas it, it just it flows you know like like milk it has a truth to it it's such a such a gift <laughs> so and then um, today I found all of the conversations so stimulating so amazing and it's inspired me uh, I, I have actually a proposal a very practical proposal that I think will help move things forward and it has to do with poetry. And I've been blown away because the ideas that I've been working with as a poet for decades and decades now have to do with poetic meter and the importance of meter 
uh, in an age of free verse, in an age when uh, about 100 years ago, just about exactly 100 years ago, as you all probably know, poetry in English became tied to the page. It had to do with the development of the typewriter, actually, as well as the rise of academic study of poetry. It became free verse on the page. The line break, the visual line break became extremely important. And the whole idea of hearing and memorizing the rhythms of poetry began to fall away and became associated with children's poetry, with low class popular poetry, uh, verse, hallmark cards and all that. And it became, it lost the dignity of, of true poetry. So to me, this is an extreme wound in the culture and listening to Jen's ideas today and hearing her, seeing her book again has made me realize um, even more how urgent uh, this is in terms of, of poetry that we get back to meter. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about the ways that I feel that poetry in meter offers is a gift. It's a way of making language into a gift. And uh, there are three ways basically that poetry in meter, form, rhyme does this. And I'll just give you first my definition of formal poetry, which is poetry that has patterns, that poetry that is structured through pattern, not just decorated through pattern, but actually structured through pattern. So if I say roses are red, violets are, are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you, everyone knows that that's right. And if I said something that didn't rhyme, you would know that was wrong. That is a structural pattern as opposed to just a decorative pattern where you might have pretty language just repeating itself just for, for sounding good. But when it's structured, you have expectation fulfilled. And that in itself, I think, is very much a gift, a gift given and received. So in that way, a poem that's in meter, form, rhythm, rhyme, gives a gift to the reader. Um, it also gives a gift, I believe, to itself, that by a poem repeating itself, the process of mirroring is very much like the uh, proto-conversation that Jen was talking about. When you have a line, like in the example I, I just gave, the, the um, blue and you, they mirror each other, they give to each other. That ooh sound is a gift from the word blue to the word you. And in the same way, we see the same thing with metrical patterns and with stanzaic structures and with all the patterns that shape poetry in any language. And another beautiful aspect of this is that in any language, the shape of the meter of a poem is going to not be an accident. It's always integrally related to the in original nature of that language. So that in Chinese, the poetry is in a meter that is created through tones because tones have significance in Chinese. In English, the meter is created through accent because accent is meaningful in English. So Thomas Jefferson advised his grandson to read poetry as a way of learning a language because the meter of a poetry of poetry is actually the essence of how language means. And I think that's one reason that children love poetry so much. They're actually learning about the language by, by learning metrical poetry. And of course, children's poetry rhymes and is in meter now more than, far more than any adult poetry nowadays. It's gone totally out of fashion. So uh, poetry that's in form is a gift in the sense that it's a gift to itself through meter. It's a gift and through repetition and mirroring of itself and its own pattern devices. It's also a gift to the reader uh, in the sense that I believe it's not an exchange value, especially a poem that is very structured and formed. It's not like regular language. So it's a one-sided gift. It's, and I also was reminded of uh, David Schnarch, one of my favorite writers about relationships, says that um, in his book, Passionate Marriage, that intimacy can be a one-sided thing. It doesn't have to be reciprocated to be true intimacy. And I think that's very significant here in terms of intimacy is it can be a unilateral gift and still be real intimacy. And in the same way, a poem is a unilateral gift because it provides at its best the linguistic experience that the reader would never reciprocate uh, or very rarely would the reader reciprocate in kind. So it is a unilateral gift. And it's also a, a gift in the sense that it can be memorized and given 
in a way that a poem on the page simply can't, um, you know, a, a free verse poem. Poems in meter and rhyme were developed in order to be memorized. They can be given away, they can be shared, and they're a gift to the culture. They can be passed on for centuries and millennia. Um, so in that sense also, a poem in meter is a gift. Um, that's really all I wanted to say about just the, the profound connection I see here between poetry in meter and uh, and Jen's work. And uh, it has made me even more convinced that this is really important work. And I am going to write this book that a friend of mine persuaded me years ago I should write after hearing me go on and on. She said, you should write a book called How Poetic Meter Can Heal You. Mm -hmm. And in my work, I work with five different meters. Uh, since, since free verse came along, most people don't work with any, or if they do work, they work only with one iambic meter. And I have a system, if anyone is part of my poetry, which community, you know, I have a whole community built around this idea now, uh, which is that there are five basic meters that, that I work with. They create a compass, four directions, and a center, and each has its own rhythm, and they correspond to the will, the mind, the body, the heart, and the spirit. So, and you can hear this in regular speech. Like when I heard um, Susan talking, she said, uh, you know, uh, she was quoting from Jen, and she used the rhythm of the heart when she quoted, I can't find the note right now, but when she spoke of the gift in the heart of our language, this is, now I am speaking the rhythm of the heart. And uh, it, when we only have one rhythm, right now the rhythm that's dominant, iambic, is the meter of the mind. And it has its place as one of five, but right now it is dominating everything. Either there's chaos or there is the meter of the mind. That's our situation right now in terms of poetic structure. And I think that by developing people's literacy in these other rhythms, whether they're poets or not, just giving, and I'm teaching poets as fast as I can to use these rhythms so that we can get these poems out there where the language gets back into a rhythm and is not so much about the mind, the exchange of, the poem for meaning in the mind, but instead becomes a communion with the body, with heart, with spirit, and in these different rhythms that, that have these um, responses, create these responses in us as, as far as I have experienced it in my teaching for many years, these different rhythms do relate to different aspects of ourselves. So I have a poem, I would like to close my little spiel with a poem that I wrote for Jen. And I've been revising it so she hasn't heard this final version of it, though she did see an earlier version. And the poem is in the rhythm of the heart, the dactylic rhythm. It's called Gifts Will Be Given. And the epigraph is Ostera, uh, the pagan original uh, Easter goddess, uh, Rome 2020. I was so struck by the sight of the Pope doing mass to this empty square with nobody there during COVID um, at, at Easter 2020. Gifts will be given. Ostera, Rome 2020 for Genevieve Vaughan. One gives in order to receive, not just in order to satisfy the need of the other. In fact, the need of the other is used for the satisfaction of one's own need. Genevieve Vaughan, The Gift in the Heart of Language. Gifts will be given to all who remember. Under cold marble that clusters and domes, waving a still prowling, still violent God, chanting men pace in exchanging sad robes. Yet through our wisdoms of giving, our weaving, Though these stone squares echo still with our absence, gifts will be given to all who remember how we are human and how we can give. Now through our wisdoms of giving, our weaving lives touch like lost channels loomed back to webs, loved beyond balancing. As wild wise words unfold and fold, till they're heavy with now, now through our wisdoms to all who remember, yes, it is happening. Gifts coming close, linking us sudden in words, hugs and eyes. 
gifts in the heart of our languages shared now through our wisdoms of giving. Our weaving dances us back to together again. Gifts will be given to all who remember still to be, yes, to be human again now. Through our wisdoms of giving, the weaving moves us until we have burned to be here, naked as birds, naked as stars, circling moon-wise, as ready as home. Gifts will be given to all who remember. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you. Yes. That's so, great. Jen, yes. Are there, are there words you'd like to offer right now as we uh, transition? No, just thank you so much. What a beautiful poem and beautiful thoughts. I mean, I, that, this whole idea of changing the meter is really important and you can create social change that way, which I think is just too cool. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Jen. thank you thank you um well we have a little bit of time left a short amount of time left um but annie i wondered uh darsha was asking if you could name the other meters for the four directions yes yes, yes the meters that i have are um the Anapest in the south is the meter of the will. And I also heard that when uh, Susan was talking, when she was describing the current situation. Uh, the south, Anapest, meter of the will. Uh, the mind, Iambic, meter of the mind uh, in the east. And in the north, Trochees, the meter of the body. In the west, Dactyls, the meter of the heart. And in the center, Amphibrax, the meter of the spirit. Mm. It is a counterclockwise circle. Moonlight. That's, that's beautiful. That's very beautiful. Thank you for that. I can, I can actually see um, a movement, uh, maybe perhaps a dance that actually has aspects of each of those done in, as a visual. That yeah. would be beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Yes. I've been working on sort of a, a yoga practice to do them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Jen, would you, uh, where would you like to go right now? We have a, we really have a very short amount of time, probably about uh, 25 minutes that we can either uh, do some, take some questions that, that have been entered into, or if you had some dialogue that you might want to do with each of our speakers. And I want to remind you all again, um, our session is recorded. So you will be able to go back and um, take notes and write things down that you need to. And we are just delighted that each of these women will be back in two weeks again to actually give us a longer um, portion around their specialty that has to do with language and dialogue with Jen. So Jen, what would you, where do you think you'd like to go with this right now? I don't know, let's ask the others. Do y'all have something you wanna talk about in particular? Today, before we actually end. Um, let's see, then let's take questions from the public and see what they want, want to talk about. Okay. And we can all discuss them, yeah. Yeah. Um, Liliana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Is there yeah. a question you'd like to offer for us from the... There's a question from Constanza Jaramillo, and she's, she asks, the, uni, the uni, unilateral gift that nature offers us, an example of how humanity can, re, can learn to improve relationship with their lives and the world, I didn't quite understand the question. Is that the unilateral gift of nature is a way we can, is there a way we can improve our relationship? Well, yeah, if we realize, if we realize we are in relationship with nature 
and then we can consider ourselves in the community of nature. We are in that kind of a communal relationship. And so we have to honor nature as she gives to us, we have to give to her. And it, 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 the gift goes around. I don't mean it as an exchange. It's just that because we're in the same community, we give to each other. And uh, the same with people. I mean, we all need to be in a community that, that honors the gifts that we receive from nature and from each other. I mean, it's, we have a way that I think is, is the way that begins in mothering and the family where people support each other and give to each other. But then it's a much wider situation than that in a whole community and the we don't realize it but exchange just messes it up altogether it comes in and and separates people creates competition power over each other because one has more than the other and uh it's the the basis of i think one basis important basis of the relationship with gift giving is that when you give to another person and satisfy their need, you're implying that they are valuable for you. So you imply the value of the other person when you give to them. If you're exchanging, you're only implying your own value because you're not doing that to satisfy their need, but to satisfy your own. And so it separates people instead of one person giving value to the other. Well, in a community, everybody is giving value to each other all around. And the same thing when you're with nature. As you give to nature, you give value to nature. As you receive from nature, you receive value from nature. So I think that we haven't understood the basic logic of gift giving. And we've always had our minds caught in the logic of exchange. And we have to, we have to transition out of that or hurry out of it as fast as we can. Thank you, Jen. Mick Mahan, I wondered if you had some ideas about this uh, language and uh, nature. Uh, I'm just, uh, I feel like I'm just so, uh... Uh, in an expanded space <laughs> as I'm listening to everyone and I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, and these are the conversations we're having in my language, in our language here at our circles in the community, indigenous communities among women. And, um, you know, the, uh, the, instructions and a way is already among us you know through our ancient languages all the ancient languages of our mother tongue they're all given us some uh direct it's it's informed us and it's they're very instructive and very directive about uh, ways to practice uh, the gift given. Um, you know, um, when, when these languages were uh, severely assaulted, of course, it gave away, uh, moved us away from that source of the heart of giving, as we're talking about today. Um, and for us, our language has not been colonized that long, so we still have access to the original meanings of it. And so some of the examples in the languages are, uh, you know, every, every year we, it, before uh, our celebrations were moved to align with Christian practices, no disrespect, um, uh, the seasons were like we would say in the seasons is uh, jibusu banana. And that was understanding that the great opening, the vaginal wall, the, the doorway was opening. So everyone brought that forth. So it's an immediate understanding of what is taking place. And so to, today, uh, when we ask, 
when we meet and greet each other, we would say medalen, meaning like we're asking um, uh, how your state of being is or how are you? Uh, the response is wule, and it's and the response wule means like today people say, oh, it must mean well, well, I'm well. But the, in the, uh, our original meaning of wele is we're acknowledging that the umbilical cord, we are still connected to the umbilical cord of life and life is continually flowing. So you're continually nourished and being and gifted for as long as you're breathing and alive, you're being and gifted through this umbilical cord. So you're acknowledging that. You know, and so when our languages were outlawed, that's what was severed. Now we're, you know, defining the languages today of what we're talking about, the, uh, the colonization and the uh, uh, moved away from the feminine lens of who we are and how we understand ourselves. So those are uh, keys of what the gifts of our ancestral grandmas, grannies gave, left for us, you know, so. Uh, I'm super, super uh, full today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Meg Mahan. Um, Susan or Annie, did you have any words you wanted to uh, respond to this question? Do I, should I say something, or does Annie? Sure, if you would like. Annie. Yes. Let Annie speak first. No, that's Annie. all right. Um, I was just thinking about the umbilical cord. And so the question is totally out of my mind. Can someone please rephrase it? <laughs> we were we were talking about, you know, the unilateral gift um, and nature and being able to come back to that, perhaps was part of the question. Yeah, yeah I would just say, you know, for me, it's about cycles and repetition. And uh, I, I feel the biggest separation between nature and the experience under patriarchal capitalism is the loss of cycle, the loss of repetition, the loss of expectation and fulfillment uh, that, that you have uh, in, in meter. I feel that so strongly and, and just in the sense of being still connected to, to the umbilical cord, connected to to our our childhood and and our birth it, it's just yeah it's it's a great tragedy and I, I think you know as as a as a person who speaks a, a colonizing language I, I just feel the pain is is so great um I would really love to talk with you more Mahan about um the the Wabanaki poetry and you know the shapes of it and things like that um if you'd be willing to connect sometime about that because now when people it was only you know 50 years ago that in english those patterns were lost but now it's spread to all the other cultures copying us they've given up on their old forms of poetry but if you go back a little bit, they usually have a structure that's memorizable. And so as a translator, I'm very interested in conveying those shapes and patterns into English so that people can experience the physical reality of the original forms. And most translators don't do that now when they're translating from um, an older language that, has, that still has poetry that has shapes and cycles, patterns in it, they leave them out and they just pretend it had no patterns and shapes. Um, but as a translator, I really like to convey those into English. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Annie. I will say in the Philippines, um, with the uh, identified 135, 150 indigenous peoples there, um, their epic stories are still chanted in their original forms. And some of their chants last for days, yeah. days and wow. weeks. So yeah. um, uh, you have lots of places around the world where you have plenty to research yeah. and identify. And it used to be that way in every language and yeah. every culture. That was the beginning of it. So how, be how beautiful. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Susan, 
Would you like to offer something to this question and this, these themes? Sure, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I find it very interesting to underline. Thanks also to Annie Finch. Uh, I loved your poem <laughs> and what everybody has uh, said so far, of course, but that poem was special. Um, the importance of rhythm, uh, we're talking about the importance of the body. It's such a characteristic of dominant philosophy in Western, at least in Western civilization, that of... Uh, dividing body from mind body from the body from the spirit whatever you want to call it um, and impose categorization binary thinking oppositional thinking you know it's black or it's white it's good or it's bad whatever uh, where, and, and uh, whereas it's just so, so important uh, if we want to heal uh, and create a better world to remember and recover uh, our relationship to the body, uh, which is in line with Jen's um, gift giving model, nurturing model. Um, I was just thinking about a, a woman I uh, have researched into all my life is Victoria Welby. She's an English woman who uh, introduces uh, significance as her. Uh, as the name of her theory of meaning, she takes the distances from all the men that um, the traditional uh, um, uh, representatives of the language sciences. And she has an interesting correspondence with lots of women, amongst whom one Mary Everest Bull. Mary Everest Bull uh, 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 was the wife of George Bull, the, uh, the mathematician, also the niece of uh, the man who named Mount Everest. Um, but uh, in her correspondence, she, um, she, she talks about logic. She's a mathematician, but she talks about uh, love, uh, love as the uh, a priori, the beginning of any possibility of developing logical logic and logical thinking. And in her correspondence with Welby, they talk about rhythm. You know, it's a it's a it's a fundamental topic uh, in their exchanges and the power of rhythm and how the power of rhythm is far greater than that of explosions. So, <laughs> talking about men and women, I think it's fantastic. Fantastic. And then, of course, um, the, uh, the relationship to the land, it, it's all part of it. Um, the characteristic of life is uh, interconnectedness. There's no way any form of life can survive separately from another form of life. It's interconnectedness. I mean, the, the magic of life is the condition of interdependency. Uh, capitalist thinking has, has trained us to think about uh, asserting our independence, uh, our difference, uh, that is our identity. Sure, but the point is we mustn't forget that this difference, this identity, uh, is connected to the other, it has the other uh, at, uh, at its heart, the other at the heart of language, the other at the heart of identity. And this is what um, uh, dominant systems uh, make us forget. Uh, the condition for survival is intercorporeality. It's a fact, it's a fact of life. Uh, and this is what we need to recover and translate. You used and he used the word translation, and, and rightly so. Uh, where there is life, there is translation. Without translation, there is, life cannot survive. And this is translation through the rhythms of life, which are the rhythms of the body, whether the human body or the non-human body, or even, uh, even the chemistry, the physics of life, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, was... Susan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Judith, do you have a, a question you'd like to put forward? We have a little bit of time left. Uh, there's been some discussion in the chat um, about Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, book, um, Braiding Sweetgrass, and um, Mary P uh, Pierce Brosner, Brosner says, um, that she speaks of the grammar of animacy 
and uh, quotes uh, Robin Wall Kimmer um, that um, sitting with trees and says, after the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this is my first language. So that ties together the themes that we've been talking about, about um, language and nature and, and uh, mother. Um, and um, I guess the question that, that arises is um, how do we start moving uh, in addition to, to what Annie suggested about using more um, rhythm and, and paying more attention to the rhythm. And as a drummer, I completely agree with that. Um, how do we move in that direction? Which of you brave women wants to go first or do I need to call on someone? <laughs> That's a, that's a, how, how do we move forward into that? Yeah. Uh, and that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> that is, that, isn't it though? It's quite the problem. <laughs> um, that's why we're actually having these salons is to be able to really go into deeply into this inquiry. So your first thoughts, not the answer perhaps, but maybe some first thoughts would be great. Well, can I just, I'll, I'll just say that uh, uh, we all need to act, obviously, within the circles that we live in and in relation to the people uh, that we can reach. And so uh, I always feel insufficient, you know, uh, we really are um, living world emergency. Uh, just look at the way COVID is being managed. Uh, so what do I do? I, I, I do what I can in the classroom. <laughs> I talk to my students and I, I tell them what I think. I use, um, I do courses in semiotics, philosophy of language and theory of translation, uh, semiotics of translation. Uh, and I use academic texts uh, as a pretext to talk about, uh, well, I connect, it's not a pretext, I connect study to life. I always try to push uh, the students to uh, think critically, to think critically and also uh, to um, uh, think politically, to take an interest in politics. Um, so that's what I do, um, which is not enough, I know, but you know, <laughs> one life does what it can, what it can, and, and that's, what, that's where I reach. Thank I you, Susan. How about you, Jen? Well, I do too. And I think, um, you know, just the, I believe that we've, that we, we are thinking in the wrong way, uh, that we as a society, as patriarchal capitalism, there's a widespread uh, wrong idea about who we are as human beings, what we ought to do, and, uh, and so on. And, and, and people also, you know, approve of of the billionaires and and of the people that are actually creating terrible harm and 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 the the pending war against china against russia you know all of this build up so it's people are thinking the wrong way and if they could think more in terms of maternal gift economy i think they would not do that so my my uh, my strategy is to just chip away at it as much as I can and try to uh, try to to make it as clear as possible to them and everybody how how we are in the wrong <laughs> mindset and what we can do to, to to change our mindset so change our way of of behaving. So that's that's what my 
project is. And the point, the point is it's 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 revolution, but it's slow revolution that has to be done properly, systematically, through education, through communication. I mean, if you look at if we look at what social media are doing to the world today, it's completely homologating. I mean, obviously there are incredible, extraordinary, extraordinary advantages to um, progress, technological progress. Look at what we're doing now. We're communicating thanks to technology and progress. But the problem is that there's another side to all this, and this is, and it's, and it's to do with homologation, leveling everything onto one vision of the world, one system of values, which is the neoliberal capitalist interested in exploiting the other uh, to my own self-interest, and that's it. So this is where I think it's so, it's just quite dumbfounding to see how unaware the young people are uh, in the class. I'm talking about university. There's just no, very rarely is there any form of critical thinking, any form of critical uh, discussion and awareness. So therefore they are completely disabled. It's a terrible example of disability. This is the real disability today. The incapacity to think critically or to think and also to misconceive to think that the fact that we have the world at our fingertips through communication because we can reach anywhere uh, in no time whatsoever um, the the idea that that means freedom which it doesn't it doesn't at all it's just like the idea that uh, because a leader is a leader and occupies an important place, he knows what he's doing. That's another error, that's another mystification. Very rarely are the best exemplars of humanity the leaders, our political leaders, <laughs> religious or, or not. <laughs> Politically you. speaking, you know, very rarely are they the best. <laughs> May I just say, Political I think consciousness. that, the, that the idea of the slow change it's a good idea, but it's it, we don't have time. We have so. we're we're in an emergency. You're right. I, I know. You're so right, and the planet is telling us as much. Yeah. It's serious. So, I have a question for Jen, which is in. It seems as if the the maternal is a very key, crucial aspect of of your work in this book and throughout. And I'm wondering. I was talking to my husband about this and about the mothers and 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 um, I said that when the children were little, some of the work that he had done had been mothering work. He said, "Well, it was fathering." Um, and I wonder, you know, is because it seems to me that this is this is a key element that is missing on the current left politics is this maternal aspect and what would be maybe the the practical app, the practical implications of that bringing that maternal forward more as you see it um well i, I yeah i i i don't know i talk about mothering really identified with women because women have suffered from being uh, mothers for so many centuries and being dominated by patriarchy. Uh, but I do believe that men can also mother. And it's just having taking away the, the gift economy, the maternal gift economy from boys that has that allows them to be violent and to take this other uh, road towards violence which is like hitting also creates a connection with the other person, like giving does. But it's kind of like it's the alternative to giving that m boys have because they're told they're not supposed to mother. And, uh, and so that there is a knot there that needs to be untied and figured out and so that boys can be allowed to be maternal, that is to pr practice the maternal gift economy. Thank you, Jen. Um, Mid Mahan, do you have some words that you'd like to offer to this question? I want to apologize. Uh, I was answering one of the questions uh, on the Q&A as uh, the question was uh, brought 
but I had um, um, the gist of it when in here and everyone, and I just wanted to, again, um, uh, uh, so appreciate what er everyone said, because I am in, in, in line with that as well when in coming from the indigenous worldview and and about the the way we understand about um how what are we doing and uh, how the language um uh, is uh, uh the changes that need to take uh that come about and uh i agree jen like uh, with jen in that it's going uh, we've been on such a wrong track and it was intentional. And so the conditioning, you know, has taken place. And it's, I don't, I strongly believe it will not take too long for to unravel the patriarchy that has, uh, uh, that we're all in it. And I think it's already happening anyway, uh, maybe in the new, in the evolution of humanity, new language, new terms. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with, uh, the, the today's language, but we're kind of back into the full circle. And maybe because we're so slightly distracted in all that has been created, because we've co-created also um, what exists today under uh, colonization and the patri paternalistic model uh, somewhat, you know, uh, and uh, so the question I was trying to respond to was Marie from uh, Halifax, and it was about, um, and maybe I know I'm just checking the time, um, about treaty relations, uh, acknowledging unsurrendered, unseated. Um, we've kind of been corralled into starting to do that. But this is a still a colonial patriarchal model that we're in the language and conversing mm -hmm. under, because there's no way we would be talking mm -hmm. in that way. We don't have a word ownership in our language. And I know a lot of uh, uh, the male academics would come after me pretty, uh, you know, strongly by saying, you can't talk like that out there, you know, reminding me that we're still at war with colonizers, <laughs> you know, and that that's the language they understand of owning, ownership, territory, all that, but that doesn't exist in our language as we understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, how, you know, and this is again about uh, the love that we're receiving from our sacred mother earth, you know, and being, and her being guided by uh, Depkuna Set Nagu Set, which is a, a grandmother moon and our grandmother's son. And so uh, that's just in, uh, in our mind when we are fluent in the language and we raise in our children in that way. So, uh, so the feminine, and we know uh, after menopause, what grannyhood that uh, one of the sisters were talking about here and uh, about why, we have to question why are uh, this uh, uh, wonderful uh, wisdom and rich resource are being under the first target of attack. You know, I, I I'm uh, everything that's been spoken of. You know, I feel like I'm in different. Uh, I'm going in and out of different realms because of all this uh, um, onslaught of different uh, uh, ways of this this. Uh, this devalue in life of how we, uh, what will it take for us to uh, shift the energy to back to the heart. And, and we just need to go in sync to harmonize with nature. You know, they, we know how it feels. We, uh, um, that when we're children of neglect, and this is where the state of the world is, the, you know, humanity, uh, the leaders of the world are wounded individuals who've been truly neglected and disconnected. So mothering grannies are so paramount <laughs> in bringing harmony and balance back to humanity. And we have such a wonderful support uh, of uh, our grandmother moon, our grandmother's son and our earth mother. So, 
we have to connect <laughs> with that, with them. Yeah. Thank you so much, Meg Mahan. Well, I'm looking at the time. We only have a few more minutes left before we have to close out this session, but here's the, um, uh, the good news. The good news is that each of these women, including Vandana, who has left for the evening because it's early, early in the morning, her time now. Vandana will be back with us next week, as will Mig Mahan, Susan Petrelli, and Annie Finch, and Genevieve Vaughn. So I want to thank all of you um, speakers who've contributed to this very exciting conversation uh, that we get to continue in two weeks. So um, your questions are well received here and we'll make sure that each of our speakers has a copy of both the chat and the Q&A so that they can follow up on those and perhaps respond to some of that in our next talks. Um, Diane is uh, putting a link in the chat right now that says registration is now open. So please do register for our salon in two weeks, salon number 25. Um, that's gonna be on January the 29th. Jen, is there anything that you'd like to close us out with? Oh, I just wanna thank you all so much for coming and speaking uh, your truth and your heart and uh, your wisdom. And it's just a, a so such a blessing to be with all of you even though we know the world is in such terrible trouble, it's wonderful to know that women like you all are out there and my friends. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Thank you, um, Jen. I want to remind you all, Jen did uh, mention to us um, beforehand in another conversation that the gift in the heart of language is available at amazon.com for if you have a, a, a Kindle, you can download it and it's, quite reasonable. So you can get that and take a look at that. Um, what else did I want to say? There will be a recording. So I want to encourage you to go back and watch the recording because there was so many juicy pieces here that were offered. And um, that will be posted at the maternal gift economy movement.org. If you have any additional questions, please do send them to us or any feedback and comments to the maternal gift economy at gmail.com and we will respond to you. I want to thank Diane, Ellen Escoco, who handle our technical aspect. We had a little instability, but what but we up held it up. Um, Judith and Liliana for monitoring the questions. And I am Leticia Layson. It has been an honor to have Meg Mahan, Vandana Shiva, Genevieve Vaughn, Annie Finch, and Susan Petrelli with us today. Please, everyone, be safe, be well, be kind to one another, and share your gifts. Take good care, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye for now. Bye. Bye, everybody. Um, bye, everyone. <laughs>